Okay, thank you for the invitation to speak here. So I'll talk about a series of work which I wrote with Mirdad Mirbabai, with Kiavita Garbenka, and uh, with another student in NYU. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's all in plank units, yeah. <laughs> uh, with Guzman Hernandez Chifle, and as usual, uh, you should blame me for all the confusions here, but I hope to convince you that there are some actual interesting technical calculations here. Uh, uh, besides the confusion. So uh, let me start from, uh, well, I already thank the organizers for inviting to this, uh, talk here, but well, these are reasons why they shouldn't have done that. Uh, so first, this talk will be about a very, very simple two-dimensional model, two mean one plus one. Uh, second, there will be no cosmology in this model, well, almost no cosmology. And also, well, what happens in this model sounds somewhat crazy since, well, what happens there is what happens. It's a calculation. But any attempt to translate lesson from here to four dimensions sounds a bit crazy, I think. Uh, however, well, I think there are reasons still to pay some attention because, well, this is a very, very simple model. It's a model of quantum gravity, and which is, well, as close to be exactly solved as I think as it gets. So that's already interesting. Uh, and there will be first almost no cosmology. There will be some cosmology, but the reason for that because uh, this problem, this model solves the cosmological constant problem by what people who think about a cosmological constant problem would call degravitation mechanism. Uh, well, and yeah. Okay, so let me start with mild confusion, which we had uh, back uh, like a few years ago with uh, Victor and Merdad. And uh, confusion came from the following construction, which is called uh, gravitational dressing. Uh, so we, we did back then, we considered uh, arbitrarily uh, relativistic theory in one plus one dimension. Amplitude, so this, this is Penrose diagram of uh, Minkowski space, and these are supposed to be incoming and outgoing momenta uh, of colliding particles. Uh, and what's important, uh, that's one place where one dimensions, one plus one dimensions are important here. In one plus one dimensions, there is a natural ordering, na natural cyclic ordering on the set of on shell momenta, namely roughly by how they enter the boundary. So literally how, how, it, how it's drawn here. And then uh, what we did back then, we uh, wrote the following formula. So we, no we noticed that, well, one can start from initial S matrix and multiply it by a factor like this, where the sum is going over uh, cyclic, uh, 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 is use, use the cyclic ordering. Uh, and this P uh, star product is just uh, usual star product in one plus one dimensions. And L is a new parameter. Uh, well, the, the name gravitational dressing uh, refers to the fact that, well, as I'll argue, uh, there are many reasons to think about this new theory being gravitational. So you should think about L as al al analog of Planck length, Planck, uh, uh, Planck scale. Uh, and the observation back then was that, well, this new dressed S matrix, well, satisfies all what you want uh, for, for the S matrix satisfies. So it was, uh, it looked like a consistent uh, deformation of the initial theory by introducing this new uh, UV scale. Uh, now, well, these are few properties of the dressing. Uh, so first of all, well, as I said, it results in a well to do S matrix. Physical spectrum remains the same. So all I did, I just changed the values of uh, amplitudes, but uh, the masses uh, of the par of particles remain the same. So if I want to describe this new theory uh, at, uh, with the Lagrangian, that back then uh, we only could do it at low energies, I meaning at energies much smaller than the Planck scale. And it would li look like an additional uh, initial theory plus a bunch of high dimensional operators suppressed by uh, this, this uh, scale. So in particular, just uh, concrete as a concrete example, if one starts with a free massive scalar, then one would add operators like this and well, there will be infinite, infinite tower of those. Uh, now the confusion which we had back then uh, was the following. So what if initial quantum field theory has unprotected relevant operators. Well, similar, you should think about like something like standard model, which has a Higgs mass. Uh, so what happened to fine tuning? And basically, I think by, by the very definition, one cannot call this model fine tuning, by fine tuned, because, uh, well, fine tuned theory, I think it's something for which you need Ruth Goldberg kind of construction to build it. 
And here there is a very uh, simple formula which describes all the physics in the new model. Uh, nevertheless, what we managed to do, we managed to explicitly introduce UV scale in a theory uh, of potentially unprotected uh, operator. So if kind of we were experimentalist in a world like that and would observe physics like that, then uh, by the uh, uh, kind of just like we think that standard model coupled to gravity is fine-tuned, we would conclude that this theory is fine-tuned. So that was our uh, confusion back then. And uh, the uh, explanation, can we can, can could ca come up with an explanation for what's going on. Uh, and the explanation which we came up uh, with back then was the following. So, well, let, let's recap how we think about usually fine tuning. So, uh, I'm here, I'm using an example of like some SU5 guide theory, uh, so the, which kind of uh, close to standard model at low energies. So, they're actually, uh, well, uh, one thinks usually about extreme IR and extre extreme UV uh, 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 regimes in situations like that. So, in extreme UV, there is what I call 55 here. This is just SU5. Uh, gut model at high energies. Uh, then there are three potential uh, IR CFTs. One is uh, what's called CFT uh, 3 1. Here, this is, well, that's kind of when you basically kick SU5 down to SU3 cross U1 right at the gut scale, and you got SU3 cross U1. Another Higgsless when uh, the model where Higgs has a positive mass squared, so you have unbroken SU3 cross SU2 cross U1, and then again Higgs must be uh, having mass at the gut scale. Well, and the standard model is the following RG trajectory, which spends lots of RG time next to, well, SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 theory, but then uh, flow, flow, flows here. Uh, well, and the way to phrase fine union here, that one starts from describing theory from the UV, and it's basically the statement then, uh, well, you don't know, starting from this UV fixed point, you know, don't know in which direction to shoot uh, to reach this trajectory, because there is no symmetry principle which tells you how to reach this point. Uh, that's kind of conventional uh, uh, description of the fine tuning. Technically, it arises by uh, making matching calculation at the MGAT scale. So, above this uh, UV scale, theory scale invariant, approximately scale invariant. Below this uh, scale, theory again, approximately scale invariant. And as everybody knows, when we do uh, matching calculation at the scale, that's where large corrections arise. But that's how, in actual calculations, one sees uh, fine tuning. Uh, so. Uh, the observation about the model which I just wrote for you, uh, that for this gravitational dressing, for this S matrix, there is no picture like that. That theory, it's almost conventional S matrix, I said for you, uh, but at uh, energies arbitrarily above uh, this uh, UV, what I call Planck scale, uh, it, it's not, that S matrix is not as approximately scale invariant. You can see it from the fact that the phase shift uh, the gro grows indefinitely with energy. It doesn't approach uh, constant value. Uh, but there are many other wa ways to see uh, that uh, this is like that. So there is no analog of this matching calculation. You don't do matching between two different scale invariant theories. There is approximately scale invariant theory in the IR, and in the UV theory it does something else. For any relativistic quantum field theory, actually today there was a paper by John Cardi where he argues that you can do it even for non-relativistic theory. But yeah, but for purposes here, it's, for, it's good enough that yeah, you can do it for, for, for any. Well, it's, you know, it just, it's, the meta theory should be something like standard model. It's something, theory with uh, relevant operators which are not protected by, by any symmetries. That's really, but think about model like st standard model with Higgs like particle without approximate shift symmetry. So, so. no, it, yeah, it, it should be, you, you, yeah, it should be UV complete theory. So, yeah, yeah, I, so you should start with well defined quantum field theory, which has well defined amplitude at all energies. So, I'm not trying to apply it here to standard model, we can discuss it later, <laughs> but, but just as a as a challenge to at least how I thought about uh, uh, hierarchy problem, I think this construction pr for me presents a challenge to that. So I was trying to understand wh wh what's going on. So you start from some UV complete theory, which may have unprotected uh, uh, relevant operators. So you would call that theory natural if the scale of, the, of those operators is the largest scale in the theory. So let's uh, start with a natural theory like that. But then this construction allows to introduce arbitrarily high UV scale in the theory by very simple formula without uh, 
like changing any uh, any other mass parameters. Right, yeah, so yeah, so kind of it goes in that direction. If you want really to speculate, yeah, what it would mean for standard model, it would be something like that. That kind of gravity is different as far as uh, as far as uh, uh, hierarchy problem goes. And actually, this is one, this property is one of the reasons why back then we called this dressing gravitational dressing. So we didn't have Lagrangian description of this theory back then, we have just this metric description. But we expect that gravity has this property. Basically, well, there are many reasons. That kind of Roughly weinberg witten theorem tells us that gravity cannot be described by conventional CFT in the UV. But also the fact we know what gravity does. And gravity you produce, when you collect particles high energies, you produce black holes and then evaporate with a very long time delay. So it's very similar situation to what, what, what one has here. So that was the main reason why uh, we call this gravitational dressing back then. Uh, so uh, yeah, that was kind of our explanation for what happened. Uh, and I, I think it's basically right. but uh, actually, recently it, be, it was made much more precise. Uh, so there were a few papers uh, a couple of years ago under the subject which uh, Eva talked in the, in the morning, uh, which really builds up on the work uh, by the Malochik of pro from 2004, which is called TT bar deformation. So what these papers noticed is the following. So uh, kind of you think here about space of all effective field theories, and maybe it's a bit, uh, can I, uh, well, at least for me, it took time to get used to this language. But you, the way you think about it, you think about local operators as tangent vectors to the, the, that space, which makes a lot of sense because when you have some Lagrangian to ch change to get a new theory, you add a uh, local operator with a small coefficient. So in that sense, uh, it's tangent operators. Uh, tang uh, local operators correspond uh, to tangent vectors to this field of uh, sp field theories, and then they, uh, there, was, there is a special operator. Uh, which is written here, which is well, the same as determinant of T alpha beta, which was studied the Malochikov, by the Malochikov uh, back in 2004. Uh, and what they consider, they consider a trajectory in the field space, uh, which has the property that at each point, uh, the tangent vector to this trajectory is given uh, by, by, by this operator. And one, uh, yeah, should, uh, it's important to, to say that it's, one should, it's not an RG trajectory. It's really just a trajectory in the field space uh, even though if you start from a uh, conformal fixed point, then because there is a single scale in the problem, the, namely the scale introduced by this operator, then it would correspond to RG trajectory. Or in other words, when you go far away asymptotically, it becomes an RG trajectory. But in general, it's just a trajectory uh, on, on the field space. And they notice that uh, this theory is solved, is solvable. So any theory on, 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 on this uh, trajectory is solvable in the sense that one can calculate finite volume spectrum for the series. If you know initial finite volume spectrum of initial, uh, finite volume spectrum of initial series, there is a simple differential equation where L here is a deformation parameter, so it's roughly distance along this curve. Uh, R is the size of the circle, P is the spatial momentum. And there is a simple differential equation which defines uh, finite volume spectrum of a new series in terms of uh, finite volume spe spectrum of the initial series. Uh, now the point it is that it will be one of the uh, things which I show in this talk that uh, this TT bar deformation is really it's, it's operator language to define gravitational dressing. So this construction is equivalent to what I just uh, described for you, and I think it makes it it kind of explains what happened here with fine tuning, because usually fine tuning arises kind of from some reductionist point of view that we think that one should start from UV to construct the theory. Uh, so that you write some microscopic Lagrangian at highest energies and then calculates all, all the IR physics. That's not what, what happens here because this TT bar is ir irrelevant operator. So all the physics along this trajectory is really determined by the physics of your initial quantum field theory. So you bu you're building your theory starting from IR into UV. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so by, yeah, so by, yeah, here this theory, well, you can do, you can think about is also the effective field theory construction, but uh, really kind of to, uh, yeah, the, the way I presented it, yeah, so one should start, this theory should be UV complete theory. So you start with some UV complete theory. So in this conventional quantum field theory, so in that sense, all notion of naturalness applies to it. So you, if you want it to look tuned, no, no, just standard model, something like, well, standard model without Landau-Pole, so, but, 
with Higgs mass being the heaviest particle there. If you just take this quantum field theory on its own, with Higgs, well, again, without U1 Landau pole, some version of standard model where, which is UV complete, but where the heaviest, the, where Higgs is the heaviest particle, that theory is perfectly natural, is like, is a, is a standalone theory, uh, right? And, uh, but then, kind of what happens here, then one can, one introduces new UV scale in this theory, uh, but, Really, this, the way this UV scale introduced, there's no, all the physics in the UV determined by the physics of the, of the starting model. So uh, there is no kind of, it's very different from usual reductionist view of, of physics. We're not starting from high energies in deriving uh, physics at low energies from there. We're starting from this given QFT, and we kind of build from there physics all the way to the UV. Well, and I think it makes sense, again, in gravity, we know reductionism breaks, right? We, we know that when go, we go above Planck scale, well, there is no sense in which well, con conventional re reductionism works. Uh, anyway, so I think that, that makes, that picture makes it more precise what happened in this construction. At least it gives precise RG, uh, RG picture uh, for what, what, what the series are. So they really should be thought of kind of RG trajectories from, from IR into the UV, and that's how they, they, they avoid uh, fine tuning. Uh, now, well, the rest of the talk, the rest of the talk, first, my goal, will, I will explain why these two things are the same. Uh, and the way I will do it, I will show that, well, I will basically write uh, a theory from which I will calculate, like a like Lagrangian description from which I will get both uh, finite volume spectrum and S matrix. And uh, so I should say, well, it's a bit unconventional problem, right? Usually we, uh, we go in other way around. We start with some like action formulation of this theory or formulation in terms of some symmetries and trying to solve it. So here I'm all, I already start starting with a solution. I start with exact S matrix to the theory and well, there is even a formula for exact uh, finite volume spectrum. Uh, so we are trying to build uh, action formulation uh, and well, it was a bit of a guesswork uh, how to do that. So there were several hints. So first, well, we expected theory to be gravitational for reasons which I mentioned. Uh, furthermore, we, we knew that there is a holographic form uh, of this dressing factor for S matrix which I wrote. So this is, remember this was this uh, factor, uh, this exponent which I used to dress amplitude. And uh, there is this, the following uh, nice expression for it, which at the moment is just, well, it's some integral formula. So you may get uh, this kind of expression if you consider uh, Chern-Simons quantum mechanics. So it's a theory Kind of when I think about it as theory, quantum mechanical theory living on the boundary of Minkowski space time. So it's really kind of holographic description of this theory. Uh, and well, in this Chern Simons quantum mechanics, so this X alpha, these are, uh, there are two, two fields, uh, X1 and X2. Uh, and you have just f fact of life. So if you do this path integral, you, you get this exponent. So we knew that, uh, that representation. Uh, so by itself, uh, that's not extremely useful. Uh, but the crucial hint uh, for what we, we're supposed to do came from developments in near DS2 holography. Uh, namely, uh, it was realized, well, it, it was a very confusing subject for, for a number of years, but a uh, uh, couple of years ago it was understood what's the correct way to think about it. Uh, so what happens there is then, and as the construction goes as following. So you start from quantum field theory in a rigid ADS space without, without gravity. Uh, and then the statement is that if you introduce a now dynamical gravity, which is Jacquif state Leboyne gravity, which is written here, I'll talk more in detail about this uh, later, but it's some very specific model of Zlatan gravity in, in one plus one dimensions. Uh, then uh, the uh, claim is that, uh, so one knows what happens. So in initial quantum field theory, one can calculate boundary correlators. They are not boundary correlators of local CFT because there's no dynamical gravity yet, but it's some, some formally invariant uh, uh, correlators. One calculates them and, and then uh, uh, the statement is that in the presence of dynamical gravity, well, essentially you dress what you need. You, you need average this boundary correlators with particular action of some quantum mechanical theory which lives on the boundary, which in this case it's Schwarzen theory. Uh, and kind of physical way to think about it, kind of that this gra all what happens is this gravity that there are only global modes which are dynamical. So all the kind of boundary gets deformed and you should average this uh, 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 correlators over all possible deformations of the boundary uh, with a particular quantum mechanical action. So that sounds a lot like what happened in our case. So the construction is really similar. In both cases, one starts from with quantum field theory in a rigid, some rigid space, and the effect of coupling it to gravity, well, 
we didn't know yet that it's gravity that looks like gravity for us. Uh, it, it reduces to kind of average in boundary asymptotic uh, observables with some quantum mechanics which lives, lives at the boundary. So the natural guess was that well, well what we need to do if we take L to infinity, so here this is this L here is ADS length. So if you take L to infinity limit of this theory, that one gets uh, our dressing. So that was uh, our guess, and that's uh, it turned out, turned out to be correct. Uh, so heuristics here goes as following. So well, let's look in more detail in this action where I took L, L to infinity limit. Uh, so this phi you may think about is a Lagrange multiplier which forces metric to be flat. So flat metric means that it's pure, pure diff, so it can be written in this form. And then uh, when, when you plug it in the cosmological constant, vacuum energy term, so this one, uh, then it reduces, well, it becomes total derivative. When you integrate it by part, you get Chern Simons quantum mechanics, which we had. Uh, so that's heuristic argument that that should be the correct uh, uh, description of our theory. So in the rest of my talk, I will make, make this precise. But while I promised to you a solution of cosmological constant problem, yeah, so that's probably the bo most boring part of this talk. So yeah, this theory does solve cosmological constant problem by what people would call degravitation. Uh, because it, it depends of the value of cosmological constant here. This phi, as I said, is Lagrange multiplier, which sets r equal to zero. But setting r equal to zero in one plus one dimensions is equivalent to setting metric to be flat. So uh, the theory degravitates. It, they, there is no cosmological expansion, even though uh, one introduced uh, in, independently of the value of initial uh, vacuum energy. As I said, it's probably the most boring and trivial part of the story. Uh, what is non-trivial? is that naively from what I just said, it looks like this gravitation should kill all the gravitational dynamics in this theory. But that's not what happened. So there is kind of, from the answer, it looked to us that theory is gravitational. Uh, and well, the, what we initially called Planck scale, that's, that, that, that this, uh, it's related to the scale of this cosmological constant problem. So uh, something quite interesting happened here. So this theory solved cosmological constant problem. You got Poincare invariant uh, S matrix. Uh, but would be the scale of would be vacuum energy instead became a Planck scale of the, of the resulting uh, uh, re resulting gravitational theory. Uh, so I think that's that's interesting and kind of the uh, rest of my talk will be to ex kind of go in detail explain what is the physics of this how 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 that happens. So I think that's really for me at least that's really a surprising part of the story here. Uh, so the gravity survives. Uh, so just as a warm up. Uh, let's see that indeed, well, it's like straightforward calculation that to see that TT bar operator appears uh, from, from this gravitational theory, namely one finds Minkowski vacuum. Minkowski vacuum has this form, flat metric, and the dilaton has this quadratic profile. And then one just looks at the quadratic perturbations. So the uh, gravitational sector here is purely topological. There are no propagating degrees of freedom here. So you may integrate, perturbatively integrate <laughs> H and phi. And when you do that, uh, then you, you see that with the leading order in uh, one, uh, in one of lambda expansion, that what you get that if effective, like an initial quantum field theory gets deformed by exactly by TT bar operator. So perturbatively, we see where TT bar operator came, comes from. So you may think about metric and dilaton beer being here like this hubbard Tartanovich field, which kind of resolve this TT bar operator uh, and uh, may make it uh, kind of result into gravitational action. Uh, so that's uh, what happens at linearized order. Uh, now, but it doesn't clarify yet much of the physics of, of what's going on, so how, how gravity survives. Uh, so to understand how to work with this theory, uh, like it's attractive to take a look at this Minkowski vacuum. So I said, well, as far as metric goes, it's just Minkowski metric, but uh, dilaton profile here is coordinate dependent. Uh, so at this st stage, one may ask, okay, why do we expect Poincaré invariant S metrics in the first place? So it's not, it uh, doesn't look like uh, it's a translational invariant uh, configuration. Well, one can go to conformal gauge, and conformal gauge, this action takes this form where omega is a while, uh, uh, while factor of the metric. And so what one finds that actually, at least, well, in this gauge, there is an additional symmetry where you can shift coordinates, but at the same time also make a Galilean shift on, on the dilaton. Uh, and that leaves this variant, uh, this vacuum invariant. So it suggests that kind of what one should really be doing. So because kind of what shifts under core. So that suggests that first of all, these are physical Poincaré translations. These are physical 
uh, Poincare shifts and with the vacuum invariant. And they suggest that the physical coordinates which one should be using is not just sigma themselves, but like derivatives of phi, because they shift uh, under, under coordinate translations. Uh, well, and actually, this, it turns out that this language, this dilaton description, uh, is not uh, the most convenient, and exactly because one needs kind of it's still not explicit, but we, ha we had to fix conformal gauge. It turned out uh, that uh, first order formulation much more appropriate to work with this theory. Um, it's an infinite volume; it's, it's really equivalent. So we go like the usual, do the usual thing. We introduce dyad, and then we introduce uh, spin connection, and the Lagrange. So there is Lagrange multiplier field. So what one writes action now re replace of G phi R uh, by two terms. The first is just a constraint which enforces metricity condition, the relation between spin connection and uh, dyads, and then the condition which uh, in, in imposes flatness constraint. Well, and actually we can in integrate out dilaton and spin connection. So at the end, the theory reduces, the gravitational sector of the theory reduces to this very simple action. So we have here uh, dyad, and we have this Lagrange multiplier which we introduced initially to enforce the metric constraint. And really, we could have started with, with this description. So it really, th this is the theory which we are considering. But uh, I went th through the steps just because, well, kind of mainly for historical reasons. But what's uh, nice about this, so now we see the symmetries became manifest. So the shift invariant symmetries, uh, they just sh uh, shift symmetry acting on this axis. Uh, so to summarize, so kind of if you, the full path integral describing the full theory now, so you have path integral of the initial theory, initial quantum field theory, which you put in some external matrix. But then you're supposed to integrate average over all these metrics uh, and uh, average also over uh, this uh, axis. And so gravity here is purely topological. So there are no propagating degrees of freedom here. Okay, uh, so uh, it's only role uh, here is to introduce kind of physical clocks and rods. So this axis, you may think about this kind of uh, physical clocks and rods, aka relational observables, or uh, so they are very similar to target space coordinates for a string. And somehow the physics is that one's supposed to use these guys to measure uh, this times and distances here. So the rest is kind of straightforward. So for instance, to calculate uh, the finite volume energy, we, we just kind of calculate partition function. So we calculate, parti uh, uh, put the theory on the torus, introduce windings for this axis. So it's very similar to, to cal doing one loop string calculation with, with windings. So that the presence of this axis, that what allows us to talk about this gravitational theory in finite volume. So one may be confused. What, what does it mean to put gravitational theory on the torus? Geometry, kind of the size of the torus is supposed to be uh, dynamical quantity. But here we have this shift, uh, shift invariant axis, which plays the role of uh, uh, natural coordinates, dynamical coordinates. So we, there is a notion what it means to put this theory on the torus. And then it's a matter of somewhat uh, painful uh, but straightforward uh, calculation. And it's very similar to one loop calculation in Palchinsky paper. But there is a difference there are extra modular here because theory is not while invariant. So there is an integration over while mode and over kind of overall uh, direction of dyad. And so that one, one, everything reduces to kind of this finite dimensional integral. So this integral localizes on uh, constant metrics. Uh, and this uh, integral, it's actually, it's a solution of uh, diffusion-like equation. And it was observed by Cardi uh, in, uh, in January that this equation, it's equivalent to this equation which I wrote to you before for the evolution of the finite energy spectrum. Uh, so that kind of, that proves that the finite energy spectrum of this theory is the same as TT bar. Uh, so how much time do I have? Okay, zero. So, uh, so I will. I just let me tell you that there is a very similar argument again when one basically one goes from this from usual coordinates to this coordinates, and uh, to cal to calculate S matrix. So basically, the trick is you solve these coordinates through like you, the field equations determine them. You look at this as a Heisenberg field equations. You look at your field mode decomposition, and you shift here everywhere like sigma by delta x, and that redefines your creation angulation operators. And when you use these new creation angulation operators to calculate this matrix, you get you get this dress S matrix. So in kind of in both calculating both quantities, what one needs to do, one needs to use uh, make use of this physical. Uh, physical coordinates. Finally, I promised you a cosmology. So uh, the simplest 
case of this theory is a like s single massless boson, uh, and that's then this deformation is described in a Bugotta string. And uh, well, back uh, even like earlier with Raphael and Victor, we noticed that for like for, for this theory, there are cosmological like solutions where you uh, so it essentially this cosmology is described as an infinitely long string, and this are, uh, there is a uh, big bank singularity here on, on, on this uh, on this light cone. Uh, but what I'm showing here is a, it's not the metric which I had before. That's induced metric. So that's a metric which kind of de 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 defines physical time delays in this theory, uh, and uh, so even though we have a completely solved theory of quantum gravity in the sense that we have uh, flat space S metrics, it's, I don't know what we can say about this uh, cosmological solution. So this, is, so this solution, which we describe for W cosmology, there is a big bang here, uh, it, uh, but it's, yeah, I don't know whether our S metrics tells us anything about uh, dynamics, like what happens on this background and how, how to resolve uh, this cosmology. So. Uh, Well, it looks, yeah, at least the, the phase value, it looks different because here we kill the dynamics of Liouville mode by imposing this constraint. But yeah, maybe there is some mapping because, well, at the end, this, this, especially this model is just, just kind of some critical thing. So there may be some mapping of that. Yeah, it would be very interesting to understand it. Uh, but so let me uh, conclude. So, well, it's fun to play with a solved theory of quantum gravity, even if it's a very simple one. Definitely challenges my understanding of hierarchy problems. So generalization to high dimensions looks hard. For me, the most robust lessons, well, two most robust lessons seems to be the first, well, maybe we should be take more seriously. We keep saying gravity doesn't have local observables and like defines only on shell quantities. So that there was a starting point here. We started with defining the series with S matrix and maybe we should be more serious about that also when we think about uh, things like hierarchy problem and cosmological constant problem in higher dimensions. And also, I think that technically we saw here that it's very important to think through what are the physical observables in gravitational theory. So this relational observables which, uh, which came out here, that's, that's what gave rise to the whole non-trivial gravitational dynamics here. Uh, and finally, well, cosmology remains a mystery even in this completely solved model. So uh, there is a lot of to, be, to be done uh, for people here even in two dimensions. <laughs> Thank you.